That one? Did we already talk about it? We didn't talk about it. Okay, so we were just talking about the synapse back here. And I talked about all the, the mechanisms that happened. They were all listed out. As the action potential is going down the axon, what's the ion that's moving in to depolarize it? Sodium. Sodium's going in, it's depolarizing that, that axon. What's racing out behind it? Potassium. Until you get down here to the terminal or the buton, the very end, then it's not sodium going in anymore, it's what? It's calcium. So the channels, these voltage-gated channels that we're opening back here were voltage-gated sodium and voltage-gated potassium, but now when you get down here to the terminal, it's voltage-gated calcium, which means the voltage, that electricity that's moving, is actually opening these channels all the way along. So this voltage-gated calcium channel pops open, calcium comes where? Does it go out of the cell or go into the cell? It goes in. It races into the cell, influx, going in, and then it sticks, in my mind, it sticks all over these vesicles. Because what it does is partially it depolarizes the terminal, but another part of it is calcium actually sticks to the vesicles and pulls them down to the membrane for what kind of cytosis to happen? Exocytosis. So now you have this area right here, exocytosis, it's opening up. This vesicle's blending with the membrane and just pushing the particles out. Once these particles are in the synapse, they move by their own energy. No energy required from outside that molecule. What's that process called? Where they go from high concentration here to low concentration. Diffusion. They diffuse across the membrane. It's kind of a slow process, which causes a slight delay called the synaptic delay. Then what do they have to stick to? What's this thing called, this area called that the neurotransmitter is sticking to? Nobody knows? Write this down, because if you don't know it, you're going to hate the rest of the semester. It's called a receptor. So the receptor is where this chemical binds. We're going to keep talking about this over all semester. When we talk about muscle next week, we'll talk about a, a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine binding to a receptor on the muscle. When we get to the endocrine system, actually we'll do it all semester. Epinephrine binding receptors on the heart. When we get to cardiovascular. When we start talking about things like uh, the kidneys and the GI tract, it's the same thing. We're going to keep talking about receptors. If you don't have a receptor for something, your body doesn't know that thing exists, period. If there's no receptors in this cleft for dopamine, how does it feel about dopamine? To care less, it doesn't exist to it. So you have to have a receptor that receives this special, special chemical transmitter. When we talk about the endocrine system, the entire endocrine system depends on receptors. When we talk about the nervous system, the peripheral nervous system next week, everything you sense depends on receptors. In lab this week, when we talk about the reflex arc, it depends on receptors. Everything revolves around receptors. Okay, so anyway, you bind this neuro uh, neurotransmitter to the receptor. That neurotransmitter is like a key that goes into the receptor lock and opens it. In this situation, it opens an ion channel and ions start moving. If it's an excitatory ion channel, what's moving? Sodium, potassium, or chloride. Those are the three we talked about. Sodium. sodium. Where's sodium going? In. Sodium's going in and depolarizing the next neuron in the pathway. If it's an inhibitory synapse, what is, what's moving out of the postsynaptic? Potassium would be moving out. What could be possibly moving in to the postsynaptic? Cl minus, which is chloride. So the inhibitory synapse are the tricky ones because they can be one of two things. They can either be chloride or potassium. Do they both work exactly the same way? Nope. Chloride's more abundant outside. Where does it want to go? Into the cell. Potassium's more abundant inside. It wants to go out of the cell. Either way, it doesn't matter because if you look at the charge, chloride is negative coming in, which makes the inside more negative. Potassium's positive going out, which makes the inside more. If you take a positive and you remove it from an area, what's that make that original area? More positive or more negative? More negative. If you remove positives from it, it makes it more negative. So it doesn't matter if you bring one chloride in or take one potassium out, you still change it by one negative amount on the inside. It's like going back, that's what I hated about first grade, learning how to add and subtract positive and negative numbers. Right, so remember, it's either an excitatory or inhibitory, but never mo both. If it's excitatory, it does this process called what? Moving up more positive, so it's the D. And in fact, it's pronounced depolarization. What's this one then? Where it moves further into the negative, hyperpolarization. Right, so that was a review, and then here's a list of some of the transmitters we're going to talk about this semester.
We did that question and now we're here. So you've just dumped all these chemicals, all these neurotransmitters into the synapse. They're firing away. They're binding to all the receptors they can. But let's say that this is a pain pathway. I'm going to go back again. Let's say this neuron down here is a pain neuron. Do you want that firing all the time? No, your life would suck. So what do you have to do to that neurotransmitter? Do you leave it out there in the synapse? You get it out as fast as you can. So you do your initial ouch, that's pain, tell the brain there's pain, and then clear the transmitters out of there. Because if that stays on, you're not going to be able to sleep at night, you're not going to be comfortable, you're not going to think of anything but pain. So we want to get rid of those neurotransmitters, and there are three ways you have to know. The first thing you can do is you can recycle it or reuptake. So there are actually little tiny transporters, protein transporters here, that also have a receptor for that neurotransmitter. So I wish they put that picture on here, but there's a little protein transporter here that will bind to this neurotransmitter so it doesn't get across. It doesn't bind over on this side. It sticks here and gets pulled right back up and recycled. It pulls it back in and restores it back into the, the vesicles. You should definitely know this process because this is an important process in pharmacology. Anytime you're talking about uh, neuroactive drugs, they work on these neurotransmitters. They work on, well, neurotransmitters or sodium, which we'll talk about later. But for instance, a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, it's inhibiting this little pump. So what's it doing to your ability to reuptake sodium, or sorry, serotonin? It stops it. So what's it do to the amount of serotonin in this gap? Well, if you're dumping serotonin out here and you can't pull it back into the original presynaptic neuron, what happens out here? It just starts accumulating. Well, what do we usually associate serotonin with? What kind of feelings? Happy, right? Sleep, happy. People that have what disorder have to take an SSRI? I guess they don't have to, but they usually do. It's depression. So if you imagine this is being a happy neuron down here, that serotonin comes out, fires the happy neuron, and makes you happy. Well, the people that have depression, they find that they have very little serotonin in the synapse. So if you block that reuptake, it increases the serotonin here and makes them feel happy. Or if you watch the commercials with the little blob that's bouncing along, it makes them feel happy, brings up their day, or commit, makes them want to commit suicide, crap their pants, and wet themselves. Right? All the little sub things at the very end, you know what I'm talking about, right? Where they speak so fast you can barely understand, but it increases suicidal tendencies, makes you have to urinate more frequently, blah, blah, blah. Gives GI upset. So all the bad stuff. That's kind of interesting about chemicals like serotonin. We always associate serotonin in the pharmacology world with the brain. You know, it's you know psychology and how it affects mood and everything. But 90% of all the serotonin in your body is actually in your GI tract. So it's an interesting thing. If you take drugs that affect serotonin in your brain, they don't stay at the, the brain. They affect everything. So when people take these drugs, it screws with their GI tract. And they usually get stomach upset. They start having a little bit of diarrhea. And then eventually some constipation that goes after that. So nasty side effects. But they feel better socially. <clears throat> okay, whoops, I guess I skipped. So where was it at? Uptake. That was number three, reuptake. Another thing you can do is you can diffuse it. The ends of the synapse are open, so they get, these neurotransmitters could just diffuse out of the synapse and go out into the interstitial fluid, just float around out there. The astrocytes that we talked about really, really briefly the first day, the astrocytes will actually vacuum them up or clean them up or recycle them a little bit too, but they can diffuse out of the synapse. And the first one, which is the third one I'm listing off, is also a really important one because this one you can destroy the neurotransmitter. This one's going to be really, really important when we talk about muscles. Because with neurons, to fire a skeletal muscle, it dumps this chemical called acetylcholine out, a neurotransmitter. That acetylcholine binds and makes you contract your muscle. What would happen if you couldn't turn off acetylcholine? Your muscles would do what? They'd constantly contract. You'd actually go into tetany and you wouldn't be able to relax your muscles. So that would be a bad thing, like the disease or disorder tetanus. With tetanus, they can't relax the muscles. They're tight all the time. That's what would happen if you couldn't turn off that neurotransmitter acetylcholine. So another thing you can do is you have an enzyme in the synapse that breaks down the extra pieces. It helps clean up the synapse so that that stuff's not bad for you. And we'll talk about that next week. All right, so there are three ways you shut off a neurotransmitter, and you have to know all three of them. Star, star. Wink, wink. And like I said, when I say star, star, and wink, wink, you might want to expect it on one of my tests, but I'm telling you because this is something you're going to use down there. If you stay in medicine, you have to know that. 
It'll come back to you when you do any, if you're doing nursing, when you're doing nursing clinicals and they t ask you how drugs work. When you go into pharmacology, they'll ask you about it. Anytime that you deal with, with the brain, everything revolves around neurotransmitters. You have to know how they work. Okay, so now we've talked about an excitatory postsynaptic potential. We've talked about an inhibitory postsynaptic potential. We've talked about those um, neurotransmitters just briefly, and we talked about the receptors. Now we have to look at that postsynaptic neuron and look at what's happening in the overall big picture, the grand picture. So if you take all the excitatories and you take all the inhibitories, like in this picture, let's say that the uh, pink ones are excitatories and the red ones are inhibitories, you have to add all of those up, and whatever wins... That's what's going to happen to the second neurotransmitter, the postsynaptic or neurotransmitter, postsynaptic neuron. So a grand postsynaptic potential is a summing of all of the uh, potentials, like this. So we can do it two ways. We can do it temporally over time and add them up, or we can do it spatially and look at the space around a neuron and add them all up. So let's say there's that second neuron, the postsynaptic neuron. Here are a bunch of the neurons that are connecting to it. So here are your dendrites. These are going right straight to the body. Let's say I have, well, in this picture, you have two excitatory. There's the EX1, EX2. And here I have an inhibitory. I can do this one of two ways. I can take a snapshot and go click and take a picture. And I count it up and I say, well, this one's firing and that one's firing, but this one's trying to shut this off. Who wins overall? The excitatory. So what do you think this thing's going to do? Will it fire or not fire? So if it's excitatory, that's like saying it's going to get excited and fire. If it's not going to fire, it's being inhibited. Which is winning? The excitatory, this is going to fire. But if this is an inhibitory, let's say that I had two other inhibitories here and I fired these all at one time, who wins now? The inhibitory. One neuron can have 100,000 other neurons coming into it. So let's say that... Uh, 70,000 of these neurons are firing as excitatory and 30,000 are firing as, as inhibitory. What's going to happen to this one neuron? It's going to fire. And what if I switch it around? 70,000 inhibit, 30,000 are exciting. It's going to shut it off. It's really important to understand how these work because one neuron is not usually controlled by one other neuron. It's usually controlled by a lot of neurons. When you add all the neurons around the space of the body, we call that spatial. So there's that word spatial summation. It means you're adding all the neurons in the space around a neuron. It's one snapshot in time, and you just count them all up. How many are excitatory? How many are inhibitory? Temporal is time. It's one neuron over time. So if I isolate one of these neurons, and I just say that I'm going to pick on excitatory neuron one, this is at the tip of my finger, and I just stab the tip of my finger with a razor blade on accident. That one is firing, but these two aren't because they're not being, they're not triggered by that razor blade. This one firing just one time is not going to do it. Did everybody catch that? This one neuron firing one time is not going to stimulate the second neuron. It's more of an irritation. But if I cut this with a razor blade and it's damaged or hurt, is it going to fire just one time? It's going to fire extremely fast, high frequency. I think I talked about this the other day. In the lab, we used to hook an electrode into a neuron and listen to it, and it would go tick, 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 tick. It's like telling the brain, I'm here, I'm firing, I'm okay, I'm alive, everything's just fine. And the brain keeps track of that to make sure the neuron's okay. But then suddenly, if that neuron gets irritated, it will, instead of going tick, 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 it'll go tick, 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 tick. If I do so much damage with a razor blade that I really hurt this neuron a lot, it's going to go and fire extremely fast. Even though these two aren't firing, this one's firing so fast, guess what's going to happen to this neuron? It's going to fire. It can't help but pay attention to this one and say, okay, you got my attention, I'm going to send the signal up to the brain and let the brain know there's pain down here. When you go to the dentist's office, and we'll talk about this a little bit later in more detail, when you go to the dentist's office, let's say that this is coming from your tooth, this is coming from your cheek, and this is coming from your pain or from your brain in some other area. When I pull that tooth as a dentist, this neuron is going to fire so fast, it's going to send a signal to the brain and say, ow, 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 this guy's breaking your jaw, right? So they give you a little chemical called Novocaine that stops this neuron. The pain, the damage that's causing the pain is still there. I mean, if you've ever had dental surgery, you can hear that, oh, you know that high-pitched thing that makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up? The pain is there. It's at the tooth, 
But this neuron is off. Does this neuron ever fire then? No. So does the brain ever get that signal? No. And we'll talk about how you shut neurons off later. But the temporal summation is that one pathway, that one specific pathway that's firing so fast that the signal goes on down the path. Spatial is all kinds of areas around here firing at one time. That's the big difference. Sometimes it's a hard concept for people to get, but temporal summation is how many neurons? One firing in high frequency. Spatial is one second in time, but lots of neurons. And the, the summation is exactly what it means. It means you're adding it. Either you're adding all of these action potentials from that one neuron, or you're adding action potentials from lots of neurons in spatial. So here's what it will look like on a graph. Here you have that, that excitatory one. It fires one time, and let's say it lets in uh, eight pieces of sodium. Is that enough to hit threshold? Nope. Eight pieces of sodium, that takes it to negative 62. That's not good enough. You have hit negative 50. And then it relaxes and it fires again. Not enough. That's not high frequency. That's just saying, hey, I'm alive. Tick, 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 that's it. But if you fire that in high frequency and you go tick, tick, then that 8 plus 8 is 16, which is enough to bump me up here, I guess, if we're using negative 55. So if we bump up the threshold, and then what's this thing? It's an action potential. Did they screw this up? They forgot what phase did they forget to put in here? Hyperpolarization. But you can see it goes all the way up to positive 30, it comes all the way back down to resting, and then you get that, a mild hyperpolarization. That's a typical action potential. Right? And then here, let's say I have excitatory neurotransmitter number one, excitatory neurotransmitter number two. You're firing this one, and then relax. Firing that one, relax. So two totally different spots. That one fires first, then that one fires second. But what if you fire both of them at the same time? So they both shoot at the same time, they hit my threshold, what do I have now? Action potential. What would happen if I fired number one and number one here? Excitatory one and inhibitory one at the same time. One lets 10 pieces of, or we'll say one lets, whatever, 10 pieces of sodium in. This one lets 10 pieces of chloride in. What's positive 10 plus negative 10? Zero. You get no change. If you look at that on a graph, there's nothing changing. The membrane potential is exactly the same. Nothing changed. So it can get more complicated. Your brain, again, 100 billion neurons with 100,000 potential connections per neuron. That's a lot. They don't all have to connect directly to the subbody of one or directly to the dendrite of another. You can actually have one that goes to the axon of a neuron that connects to another one. And I'm not going to try and get any more complicated than this. But it's almost like if you are... If you're trying to irritate this person here, you're a bully, right? So you're, act or, or you're a neuron number A. You're the bully irritating this kid. What if I'm a bigger kid than you? This little kid may be coming around the corner and not even know it, but I step in front of the bully and I stop the bully. Does that make sense? You can have another neuron that inhibits a neuron that's trying to excite another neuron. You can have that pathway. So it gets extremely complicated when you get into the brain. Your brain's just this big mass of neuron yarn. Originally, when they started looking at the brain, they thought it was one neuron that just curled around, like a person with a bad toupee. You know, they get that curl going on. They just keep winding. But what they, they started learning is that, hey, these things end and they begin. So they're all connected. And when they started counting up areas, they're like, oh my god, there are so many neurons in here, it's crazy. The guy that got the Nobel Prize for discovering that was actually ridicule, ridicule for most of the rest of his life because nobody believed it. They still thought it was one neuron. His name was Golgi. Okay. <clears throat> we already talked about that. So all these connections, there are two terms to describe the connections. The connections can come together or converge. So maybe you have all of these neurons. We'll say this is a neuron for your arm. This is a neuron from your um, finger. This is a neuron from your elbow. And let's say I smash your arm. Suddenly, all those signals come into the brain, and they send us this one area of the brain that says, hey, your arm's in trouble. Move your arm. All those neuron signals come together. You can actually see a good example of that when people have a heart attack, because where's the pain coming from? Their arm. Their pain feels like it's shooting up their arm. All these neurons are coming together on one general neuron, or at near one general neuron. They're converging, and the signal's so powerful, it feels like they have pain in their chest, in their back, 
in their neck, and down their arm. Because they all have a, a common pathway. They converge together. So the heart's sending so much pain signal that it makes that person feel like it's all over the place. The other thing they do is they divide or diverge. So this signal might go into the brain. When it gets up into the brain, it might go over to my temporal lobe. You know, it might go up to my frontal lobe. It might go to my parietal lobe, which we haven't talked about those yet, but you've learned them in anatomy. So it might send a signal to different parts of my brain to help me interpret the signal a little bit differently. One might tell me it's pain. Another one might give me a sensation like a feeling, like an emotional feeling or connection to it. And we'll talk about all of that. Actually, I think today we start talking about it. So converging means they come together. Diverging means they divide or go apart. So if I ask you a question like this, a postsynaptic neuron reaches its grand postsynaptic potential by temporal summation. What's it mean? <coughs> Break it down. What's inhibitor, inhibitory telling you? What, the, what are the first things that come to mind when you hear inhibitory? Stops it? What chemicals come to mind? <coughs> Sodium, potassium, chloride, which ones? Potassium. Chloride and potassium. I hear it from two different parts of the room, but you're both right. What about temporal? What's that telling you? Temporal is telling me it's one neuron firing at high frequency. So when you see a question like this, if you hear me say the same things over and over and over again, there's a reason. Anybody hear mind map? Do mind mapping? Okay, mind mapping is a thing you can do for notes where you take one general idea and you branch out as many ideas as you can from it. Your brain works like that, whether you think it does or not. If you've ever done mind mapping and you hate it, that's how your brain works, so get used to it. You take this one idea, inhibitory, and then the, think of the first things that pop in your mind and bring them back to your mind. When you get a test, jot them down, inhibitory. Potassium chloride, it stops things. When you see temporal, what's that mean? It means one neuron, high frequency, right? So lots of times. Not one single firing, but lots of firing. So you can jot those little notes down. Then what do you do? You go through here and you clean it up. It's, is it the same presynaptic input? Yep, so that looks right. I might circle that one. How about is it different presynaptic? Absolutely not. Cross up not. How about same presynaptic? That one looks right. Circle that one. How about different? Wrong. Circle that one. So now you have it narrowed down. It's either number one or number three. It says input fire repeatedly so that postsynaptic neuron reaches threshold and opens sodium channels. Does that seem right? If it opens sodium channels, what is it? It's excitatory. So it was right as far as it was temporal, but that's excitatory. You know that one's wrong. So let's cross our fingers and hope number three is right. Same presynaptic input fire repetitively so that postsynaptic neurons open chloride. Is that right? Yeah. It could have also said potassium. So number three is our correct answer. When you're going back through and looking at these notes and you're reviewing or whatever, you can do it however you want, but I'm just giving you an idea of how I do it on the tests. Throughout the semester, I'll give you little tips to help you maybe look at tests a little bit differently because I'd, I'd rather have you broaden your, your horizon and look at all these different avenues for taking a test or how to memorize things or recall things so that it, it spreads out across all your classes. It's not specifically for this one, but helps you in general. I spent so much time learning and doing learning and memory that I feel like I have to help somebody. And I don't teach psychology, so I can't help those people. I don't think anybody can help psychology students. I'm kidding. I have, I have a psych degree, so just ripping on psych people. Okay, two major control systems of the body, nervous and endocrine. We talked about this the very first day. Speed-wise, what's the difference between nervous and endocrine? Nervous is extremely fast, where endocrine comparatively is extremely slow. What's the name of the chemical for the nervous system? I don't know how to say it without giving you part of the word away. What's the name of the chemical messenger? There we go. What's the name of the chemical messenger for the nervous system? A neurotransmitter. What's the chemical messenger for the endocrine system? A hormone. How does this get so fast? Because what kind of signals is it sending? What kind of signal is it sending? Think of a light switch, electrical signal. What kind of signal is this sending? Basically, it's a water flow sy system, so a chemical into the blood. It's slow. It's like watching a rubber ducky flow downstream. It's slow. This is like flipping on a light switch and watching the light come on. Super fast. What they have in common, both of them alters target cells because the target cell has to have a what on it? receptor. Whether it's nervous or it's endocrine, the target cell has to have a receptor. 
In fact, some of the chemicals overlap. The neurotransmitter transmitter epinephrine is also a hormone, epinephrine. It's the same thing. One way it travels in the blood, the other way it travels across the synapse. But either way, they still have to alter target cells with the receptors on them. If you break the receptor, it doesn't work anymore. If I give you a drug that blocks your receptors for dopamine, your dopamine doesn't work anymore. If I give you a, a chemical that blocks epinephrine, your epinephrine doesn't work anymore. It's the receptors are kind of the key there. All right, differences between the systems, distance to the messenger travels. Which one has to go a longer distance? Which messenger has to travel further? Synapse or bloodstream? Bloodstream, so what's traveling further? The hormones, the endocrine system. Yeah, the neurotransmitter only has to go micrometers across that little synapse. And then signal for the release of the messenger could be different. What's interesting is that the nervous system can actually tell the endocrine system what to do. It's rare that the endocrine system tells the nervous system what to do. It's the nervous system can tell the endocrine system, you know what? Dump out epinephrine. Dump out insulin. It's kind of bossy. Nervous system's like the master controller of the whole body. It's awesome. So let's talk about it. Here's your anatomy that you should remember. You've got the central and the peripheral. What's the central made up of? Brain and spinal cord. Peripheral is everything outside the brain and spinal cord. Easiest way to remember it. When you break down the peripheral nervous system, you have the afferent, which is going where? At the CNS. And the efferent that's going out of or exiting the CNS. The afferent system going in, you can actually write next to that somatic. Or I'm sorry, somatic. I was reading. Sensory. Sorry. Afferent is sensory. And we're going to talk about sensory next week. Today, we're going to start talking about this. So the efferent division, which is somatic, which means it's, it's the motor. It's moving your body. Somatic means it's moving your body. Somo actually means body. So when you're moving muscles, skeletal muscles, that's somatic nervous system. It's typically going to be associated with voluntary. And then autonomic nervous system is automatic. Do you have control over it? Nope, it's completely involuntary. And then you're probably familiar with these systems, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. Which one's the fight or flight? Sympathetic. And then what do we call the para? Rest and digest. And then there's the pathway or how it's broken down in your book if you like flow charts. All right, major classes of neurons, or we classify them by function. The afferents go where again? At the central nervous system. So they start out here at the periphery, the receptor. That's one thing you always find at the end of an afferent neuron is some kind of receptor. It detects your environment. It detects the temperature inside of your body. It detects the temperature on the outside of the body. It detects how much sugar is in your blood. It detects light. It detects sound. It detects taste, smells. You have to have a receptor for anything, any stimuli that you want to detect. You have to have a receptor. Water concentration. So you have osmoreceptors that detect water concentration. All right, so this signal, afferent neurons have a unique characteristic about them. And that if you look at the axon, the axon comes off the receptor and actually goes by the cell body. So here's your cell body. Your cell body sits in the periphery. It actually sits just outside your spinal cord in an area called the ganglion. So those little paravertebral ganglion, those chain ganglion, the cell bodies sit out there. You probably heard the dorsal root ganglion. Cell bodies are sitting there. So cell bodies are sitting outside of the central nervous system. Then the signal goes in and connects to another neuron. Now it's inside the spinal cord or inside the brain stem or inside the brain now. There's one other neuron here that can be here, but it doesn't always have to be there. And it's called an inner neuron. The one thing about the inner neuron is it's always, exclusively, never found anywhere except where? Central nervous system. It's always in the brain or always in the spinal cord with no exceptions. An interneuron, guess where it sits between, look at its name. It sits between two other neurons. And inter means between, neuron means neurons. So between neurons. So you can have a pathway coming in that talks to an interneuron, or you can actually have this pathway where the afferent directly connects to an efferent. The efferent cell body sits where? Peripheral or central? Central. 
their cell body always sits in the central nervous system. It sends a signal out of the spinal cord and out to whatever you're trying to control, whether it's a muscle or a gland. So maybe it moves skeletal muscle. Maybe it goes down to the pancreas and releases insulin. Maybe it goes to the GI tract and does something with the speed of the GI tract. So those are the major classes of neurons. Right. Afferents always go into the central nervous system. Efferents always go out. Afferents always have their cell body outside the central nervous system. The uh, efferent always have their cell body inside. Here's another one. The afferents always connect to which side of the spinal column? Your senses always go in. Right, the posterior, which we call the dorsal side. What's the thing on the back of fish? The dorsal fin, right? What's the opposite of dorsal? Ventral. The side of the body that you ventilate through is your ventral side. So the motor neurons or the efferent neurons always come out of the ventral side. Dorsal always has a signal going in. Ventral always has a signal going out. Those are some of the keys that you always want to pay attention to. Okay, so what's the true characteristic about afferent neurons? Nuts, did I walk in here with a coffee? Did I sit it down somewhere? Oh, damn, I left my coffee in my car. It's going to be a bad day now. Okay, I'm kidding. I don't like coffee to determine my day. I can quit anytime I want. What's true about the afferent neurons? Do they carry signals away from the spinal cord? No, that's an efferent. How about number two? Axon exits the spinal cord from the anterior side. That would be an efferent. What's the other name for anterior? Ventral. Yeah. When you talk about the brain and the spinal cord, typically they use the words ventral, but it's still the front, so anterior. Number three, it's, it's the motor neuron. No, that would be an efferent. Yep. So all three of these describe efferent. So hopefully it's number four. The cell body is found outside the spinal cord. Is that true? Yep, right there. Afferent neuron cell body is found outside the spinal cord. All right, next major group. Protection, nourishment of the brain. Now we're going to start talking about those glial cells. Glial cells don't actually send signals. They can talk to each other, but they don't send it like a neuron where it's long distance. The glial cells are important because neurons are like little princesses. They don't do anything for themselves. They turn on, they turn off. Otherwise, they're pampered all the time. They always get fed. They get cleaned up after. They're protected. They ha even have another cell that wraps around them to keep them you know, comfortable. So these cells, these supporting cells are called glia, which mean glue. The first ones are the astrocytes, and these are so important. These are the most complex of the glial cells. So these astrocytes are named after their shape, where they look like stars. Yeah. So they look like little stars. Um, just to give you an idea of how important this is, everybody here I'm sure has heard of Albert Einstein. When he died, they cut his brain out and they stole it. The, so some scientists stole it. And they sliced it apart and they started looking at it and they thought for sure there's something about this guy's brain that makes him different than everybody else. And when they sliced it apart, they started counting the neurons in all the different areas and they found that for somebody his age, he had almost exactly the same amount of neurons as somebody else his age that wasn't, that could have been like a garage mechanic or something that didn't use the brain as extensively as he did. There was no difference in the number of neurons between the average person and him. But when they started looking more in depth, they, saw, they found that certain parts of his brain had more astrocytes than other people that were, you know, average people. It's the astrocytes that are actually really significant in learning and memory. Neurons are important, but without the astrocytes, your neurons wouldn't be able to do anything near what they could. When you were two, you had more neurons in your head than you have now. Now you have more astrocytes than you had when you were two. But the astrocytes, they glue down pathways. I don't know if I talked about this already, but when you think of a new stimuli, you think of something brand new, you don't grow a new neuron. What you do is you take this original neuron and you grow a new pathway from that neuron. So you grow new collaterals, what they call another branch or another terminal coming off of it that may connect to this different neuron. Well, when this fires, it leaves a lot of debris, a lot of those neurotransmitters that leak out of the synapse, and those little neurotransmitters and debris are like food for an astrocyte. So what's going to happen to the astrocyte? It's going to move over here to where the food is. So it starts moving over, and these little astrocytes come along, and they grab that synapse, and they wrap around it, and they kind of protect it. And then when it fires again, because you think that same thought a second time, more astrocytes come in. What are they doing to that synaptic cleft? 
They're supporting it. They're wrapping it up. They're holding on to it really tight. They're making it so that every time that you fire that thought, what's going to happen to the speed of transmission? It gets faster and faster. That's the process of learning. So when you learn a new thing, anything new. When I was a kid, I lived in a little tiny town, and I hated walking to school because we'd ha I'd have to leave for school at 6.30 in the morning, and in the wintertime, what's it like outside? It's dark. I left for school and it was dark, and I hated walking this long pathway. So in the summertime, what I did is I'd find new ways while it was still light out in the morning, and I found the fastest way was going through a cemetery. And when I was going through the cemetery, I would come in from where my house was through this little wooded area, and I'd go into the cemetery, and there was another wooded area on the other side. So my ass would run across the cemetery as fast as possible. But the trick was on the other side of the cemetery was a wooded area that had a lot of overgrowth. So I had to figure out the fastest way to get out of the cemetery and through that wood because do you feel any better when you walk out of a cemetery into a wooded area? Hell no, there's zombies and stuff out there. So I would find the fastest path. And if I, if I took a path this way and I thought it took me longer, did I take that path again the second time? No, the first time I went through though, I beat down all the grass. And then the second day, I'd go a new pathway. And if that wasn't fast enough, I'd take another pathway. Well, what's going to happen to these old pathways over the week? They grow back up. Those grass come back up. So if I wanted to find it again, would it be easy? No. But I found the fastest path, and every day I took that path. What happened to the grass in that pathway? I killed it. By taking that path so many times, I killed that, that grass. So when winter came that winter, and I came across running across in the dark, across that cemetery, could I see my path? Heck yeah, I could go right towards my path and I ran through the woods until I got to the other side. Super fast. That's how neurons grow. They'll try a new pathway. So when you read something in a book, you might go, oh, that's interesting. But if you don't read it again for a week, what happens to that pathway? It, yeah, it just grows over. You lose it. But when you see something that's cool in the book and that night before you go to bed, you look at it again, what did you just do to that pathway? You fired it again. The astrocytes start coming to it. And then when you look at it tomorrow night before you go to bed, what did you do to it again? More astrocytes. And if you look at it every night, more and more astrocytes beat that path down so that when you get a test in front of you and you see something that has to do with that pathway, what's going to happen? Cha-ching. You can move right through that question, you answer it, and you move on. Astrocytes are so important for your memory. So when you eat you know, good, healthy food, when you're not eating a lot of fat, because fat will make the astrocytes lazy. So when you're eating good nutrient nutrients, you're taking in your proper vitamins like vitamin C that helps support these astrocytes and you're learning the material every day, you're beating down this path and it's sticking with you. So they're really important for memory. This other one here, the blood-brain barrier, you need to star by it. This is so important. They established something called the blood-brain barrier. Let me see. Here's an astrocyte right here. So you've got the blood going through the brain. You have all these blood vessels. Normally blood vessels are leaky. They leak out water, and they leak out sugar, and they leak out toxins. They leak out anything. But these astrocytes know how valuable the brain is, so what they do is they'll come along the, the capillaries, and they squeeze the capillaries shut. Not so that blood doesn't flow through the capillaries, but so that nothing leaks out of the capillaries. Nothing leaks out of the capillaries that loves water. So water doesn't leak out of the capillaries into the brain. Glucose that loves water, does that leak out of the capillaries into the brain? No. So what do you have to have to get sugar into the brain now? If water can't just leak across and sugar just can't leak across, what helps move things that love water across the cell membrane? Transporters. You have to have special protein transporters to move it. These astrocytes are so important that they squeeze the blood vessels so tight, white blood cells can't get into your brain. Is that good or bad? What if a bacteria got into your brain? What can't get in? Your immune system. They call this immunologically privileged. Your brain only has one type of white blood cell in it, and it's in the brain. It doesn't move across that blood-brain barrier. So if a bacteria gets in here and starts replicating like they do, every couple hours you've got double the number of bacteria. If they start replicating, you're in a load of trouble. They call it encephalitis, right? So when that bacteria starts causing swelling in your brain, is that a good or a bad thing? That is terrifying. If you have encephalitis, they get you into the hospital and they will start directly pumping antibiotics into your, into your brain spinal cord. They go to the spinal cord because why? You don't have that big thick skull to go through. It's a little bit easier to get it into the tissue. And it connects right with the brain. So I've never had to have it happen, but I hear it's not pleasant. So it's immunologically privileged because these astrocytes keep the white blood cells out of the brain. Right? 
So they help repair brain injuries. They clean up all the debris, like extra potassium that gets into the extracellular fluid. Remember, you have to keep potassium low. And they help regulate neurotransmitter activity. Super important cells. The second kind is called the oligodendrocyte, and this makes myelin. So here you can see two, where'd my hand go? There we go. Here you can see a neuron, there you can see a neuron, here you see an oligodendrocyte, and it actually holds on to more than one axon. But it makes this myelin sheath around the axon. This is the sucky thing about oligodendrocytes. If you cut this one branch of this neuron, it has way, way more other connections it's taken care of. Does it really care if you lose one connection? Nope, so what's gonna happen to this neuron? It's going to lose its ability to send signals. It doesn't send signals nearly as well without that myelin sheath. When people have MS, MS comes along here and damages this myelin sheath. What happens to their ability to send signals? It slows down. It's harder for them to send signals. Does that repair? Can they fix that and have it grow back? Nope. Oligodendrocytes don't repair. Once you damage them, they're done. They just say, forget it. I give up. The next ones are the microglia, and the microglia are the only type of immune cell in the brain. They're actually a macrophage. What's it do? Eats, yep, eats bacteria, eats debris, it eats big things, right? If you have a stroke, the microglia come along and they eat that, that blood or the damaged tissue and clean it up. The next ones are the ependymal cells, and here's a ventricle up here. Remember, a ventricle is where you keep the cerebral spinal fluid, or you see it abbreviated CSF, usually. So you have that or CSF floating around here. This ventricle is lined with these little cells called ependymal cells, and they have little cilia on the surface that's constantly waving. And I think of the CSS, CSF as like ocean water, and the cilia are like seaweed on the bottom. They're constantly moving back and forth and cleaning up debris. They're helping support the you know, nutrients in that area. And they're just constantly helping circulate that fluid around. That's why they have these little cilia all over them. Right? And there's one cell that's missing that's not in the central nervous system, but it makes myelin. What's that one? We actually talked about it already. Schwann cells. Schwann cells are just like oligodendrocytes, but they, they can do what that oligodendrocytes can't? They can regenerate. They can fix themselves. All right, so which one of the, which one of the CNS neuroglia makes myelin? Where are the Schwann cells? Do they make myelin? They do make myelin where? At the peripheral nervous system. So you know that one's not right. How about we get digitocytes? Yep. So if that one looks right. It makes myelin and it's in the central nervous system. What's the astrocyte do? What was the big thing I told you? Well, two big things. They support memory and they form the blood-brain barrier. Yep. Number four, the microglia are what? They're a form of macrophage. And number five, ependymal cells, they form the ventricles and they Exactly. They help develop and clean up the CSF, cerebral spinal fluid. Right. There are other ways that you protect the brain outside of individual cells, like the cranium wraps around the brain, bone tissue. It's like a corrugated cardboard box. It's kind of fascinating because it's really thin for a bone, but the way it's designed, the spongy tissue, the spongy bone inside of it, is designed like a cardboard box, so it gives it a lot of strength and support. So you can actually take a big impact into the skull, and it can take or, or cushion a lot of that blow. Next, your brain's wrapped by the meninges. What's, what's the most durable layer of the meninges? The dura, the outer layer. The dura matter is actually periosteum that connects to the bone. So when we used to do brain surgeries, we would take, clear off the scalp, we'd cut into the bone, and as you peeled the bone off, it had the spider webby material that was holding on to the, to the brain, and that was called the dura matter. I shouldn't use the word spider webby because that's the next layer. But it was. You had to actually peel the bone off, and it had, you can see all this webbing-like stuff coming off of it because the bone is actually attached to the dura mater. Underneath the dura mater, on the opposite side, you have more of the spider web, web material, and it's called the arachnoid, like spiders, like arachnids. And that arachnoid matter has a special fluid going through it. What is it? Cerebrospinal fluid. Yeah. See, the arachnoid matter has a cerebrospinal fluid. It's almost like a little waterbed in there. So you can, you know, when you jump on a waterbed, it just splashes the top. When you take a blow to the brain, if it hits the bone and that impact goes through the bone, it hits that arachnoid matter, and it's kind of like a waterbed. It goes bloop, and just kind of shifts the fluid around. And then the innermost 
Matt, or the innermost layer, pia in Latin means precious. It's the delicate one. When you took apart the brain in anatomy and you looked at it, it's the most delicate layer. It's the one that you could take your finger and scrape across the surface of the brain and you clear, peel off this like clear cellophane looking tissue. It was really, really thin, really, really delicate. That's the part that gently holds the brain onto the other layers of dura, or layers of meninges. Right. And then the CSF I just mentioned, which layer is the CSF in? Dura, arachnoid, or pia? The arachnoid. And then the blood-brain barrier, like Ari said, what cells form the blood-brain barrier? The astrocytes. Yep. And you may not think of this as a protective structure, but it's protecting you so if anything bad gets in your, your blood, like toxins get in your blood, it keeps them out. Like for instance, penicillin loves water. Can it get into your brain? Nope. So if you get an encephalitis and you have to kill a bacteria with penicillin, can you just eat it? Nope. That's why you had to have it injected right into your spinal column. Right. So here are your ventricles again. What lines the ventricles? What cells line the ventricles? Ependymal cells. Yep. What's the fluid that goes through the ventricles? The CSF. So you make it. Here you have the laterals. The laterals, you have one. They're like ram horns sitting on each side of your brain. Those are called the laterals. So you... They're the first and the second, technically. And then the third is right in between the thalami. So the thalamus, that little egg-shaped, silly putty-shaped thing in the, the brain, right in between it, you have this third ventricle. And then that will flow down to the fourth ventricle, which actually connects to the spinal cord, and also all the way around the outside in the arachnoid matter, which they didn't draw here, but they kind of drew here. So you can see the fourth ventricle coming down, branches all around, going around the outside, and then you recycle that CSF. So here are the layers, and this is from your textbook. You've got scalp, you've got the bone, you have the dura, you can see the arachnoid matter with the CSF in it, and then you have the brain tissue itself. Okay, I already talked about this, but the blood-brain barrier, highly selective. What doesn't it let pass through? Anything that loves water. Oxygen can freely pass through because it's teeny tiny, and it's neutral. Carbon dioxide can pass through. How about acid? Hydrogen plus, so H plus. Does that love water or does that love fat? H plus. Loves water. Does it easily move across into the brain? No. Does it, if it's in the brain, does it easily get out of the brain? No. It doesn't cross that barrier. It can't cross. And that's going to be really important when we talk about breathing because if you hold your breath, guess what starts accumulating in your brain? Acid. Guess what it starts accumulating in your blood too? Acid. We talked about this the first day. So now your blood's becoming way too acidic, how do you start feeling? All that acid in your brain is making you feel lightheaded, kind of woozy. I love that word, woozy. I don't technically know exactly what all woozy in, in, you know, encompasses, but I know that feeling. You feel woozy. All right, anyway, so extremely selective. How about for things that love fat? Can you keep fat out of astrocytes? Astrocytes have a plasma membrane like every other cell in your body. Can fat get into it? Yes. How about capillary walls? Capillary walls have plasma membranes. Can fat get into it? Yes. Can you keep fat from any part of the body? Nope. If you put something fat-loving in your body, it can go everywhere. When you take in vitamins that are fat-loving, they go all over your body. They can actually accumulate in other tissues and become toxic, like vitamin A, D, E, and K. They can become toxic if you take too much in. Um, if you take a drug that works quickly on the brain, guess what it loves? Water or fat? Fat. The more fat loving it is, the faster it gets into your brain. You take heroin and morphine, they're both an opiate. They're both extremely similar, it's just that heroin likes fat a little bit better, so which one gets in your brain faster? Heroin. That's why um, addicts that get hooked on heroin, they prefer heroin over morphine because it works faster. They get the feeling faster. All right, so here's a capillary wall. You, so you slice it across the capillary, you have one endothelial cell here, you have another one over here, and then you can see those pores between for water to leak back and forth. This is a general capillary in your body. But when you go to the brain, boop, the astrocytes come along and they plug them up. So here's an astrocyte squeezing that capillary. Another one squeezing the capillary. They form this barrier around the outside and they smash those pores. Can water leak through now? Nope. Now it's watertight. Can fat leak through? Yep, fat just moves right through the endocell or endothelial cell plasma membrane, across the cytoplasm, across the next membrane, across the astrocyte membrane, and then into the brain. You can't keep the fat out. So back in the 60s when people were tripling acid a lot, 
Acid, if it affects the brain quickly, is it water or fat loving? Fat loving. Gets into your body, gets up into the brain, but unfortunately it also gets into your fat cells. So if you had the munchies while you're tripping on acid, it could store up in your fat cells. So then 20 years later, when you start losing weight and start getting your midlife crisis and you start trying to get in shape, and now these fat cells are breaking down and releasing their chemicals into the blood, what could you have had? A bad flashback, right? So you get this, you start tripping on something you took 20 years ago because it's fat loving. It's been hiding in your body all this time. Awesome. <clears throat> all right. So the brain needs a constant input of oxygen. Your brain can store just a little oxygen and it stores it in a chemical called neuroglobin. What's it sound like? Hemoglobin. Remember that first day when I told this stupid story about myoglobin? Are you noticing a pattern? All three of them store oxygen. Hemoglobin stores it in the hemo, refers to blood. Myoglobin stores it in the muscle. Neuroglobin stores it in the neuron, the nervous tissue. So it can store a little oxygen. If I cut off your circulation, if I squeeze your carotids, you still have some oxygen in your brain. So you've got about uh, roughly about 15 seconds before you black out. After that, you're working on reserves. And if you don't provide oxygen, you've got roughly five minutes before your brain starts dying. Irreversible brain damage. Glucose can't be stored in the brain. You can't store any glucose in the brain. You need it. You've got to have it. If you deprive the brain of sugar, it'll die. That's why hyper and hypoglycemia are so important. Because if you're hypoglycemic, almost all the other cells in your body can store sugar, but not the brain. What organ's going to starve first? Your brain. When you're hypoglycemic, how do you feel? Pumped up and full of energy? No, you feel kind of tired, woozy, right? You feel kind of <laughs> sleepy. You feel like you just kind of want to lay down and take a nap because your brain is slowly shutting off because it's deprived of sugar. What about hyperglycemic? When you put all that sugar in your blood, how's your brain start thinking? It's like, holy crap, we'll get the sugar. Let's do something with it. It starts burning like crazy. And you start getting all hyperactive, right? Because your brain's going all over the place. You're thinking this thought and that thought. You want to test this? This is a great experiment. Give a kid a can of soda and say, I'll give you a, a, a dollar bill if you can drink it as fast as you possibly can. That sugar in the soda, it's, it's purified sugar. It's high fructose corn syrup that doesn't need to be processed from your body. It goes into your, your small intestine, boop, right into your blood. It takes minutes for it to get into your bloodstream. And it accumulates really fast, faster than insulin can deal with it. And what's that kid going to act like a minute later? They're off the wall, right? They're burning all over the place. They're going everywhere. You can't shut them up. And then how do they feel like 10 minutes later when the insulin starts kicking in? They crash. Because the insulin comes out so high, it starts pulling, it's like freaking out. It's going, oh my God, where'd the sugar come from? Insulin starts coming out so abundantly that it over pulls out the sugar. It pulls out too much sugar, and now they're hypoglycemic. How's their brain feeling? You know, they just, they crash. They, they, they like lean on the table with their head, their face smashed. They don't care. They're so tired because there's no sugar left in their brain. Right? So the brain can't make ATP out without oxygen. You have to have it. It can't make ATP without, without sugar either. So what's the process that's so important where you need oxygen and sugar? It's called oxidative phosphorylation. What's the name of the organelle that's so important in the brain to make energy for the brain? Mitochondria. You've got to have them. It depends on all three of those components. You have to have it. Or you look like that. <laughs> okay, so organization of the brain. This is just an anatomy outline. So you want to remember the brain stem. The brain stem is the most primitive part. Even the most basic animals have a brain stem. Well, I guess not technically. A jellyfish actually has something called a neural loop. But it has its own little pre functional brain stem. It's just branched out a little bit more. If you look at an insect, they have a little tiny brain stem in there. Right? Cerebellum is the next one. So cerebellum is that little lump back behind your brain stem. It primarily controls motor functions like balance and control. Not all motor functions, but like balance and coordination control. So when you're drunk and you're kind of staggering, which they call ataxia, it's because your cerebellum is not working properly. The alcohol actually got in the cerebellum. Alcohol, alcohol loves fat. 
So it gets in all over your body. Could it get in your brain then? That's why you drink it, right? So you drink it, and it starts going in, and it takes the neurons, and it makes their membranes really loose. So they keep firing irregular and weird patterns. You can't control them the way you usually do. So sometimes they overfire, sometimes they underfire. Sometimes you get like a, a really good sensation, but most of the time, what is it actually doing to your nervous system? It's depressing it. It's slowing it down because you can't fire fast enough. It gives this really weird combination of sensations. And when we talk about the brain, you'll actually see the way I remember the parts of the brain and the functions is that when we're talking about the lobes and the process, alcohol usually starts affecting the front part of your brain and works its way back to the cerebellum. So it starts affecting things like your personality and then your vision and then affects your ability to walk. And we'll talk about that. So it kind of works backwards. And then we'll talk about the forebrain, which is what makes you human, really. Your forebrain is so developed, it's what makes us human, the way that we think about our world, the way that we can anticipate the future five years or 50 years down the road. All the other animals out there can't do that. Even monkeys, they can't anticipate five years down the road and where they're going to be. Or they haven't told us if they can. <laughs> you know, they can plan. And most animals can plan for what they're going to, you know, hunt. So they wake up in the morning, they're hungry, and they plan on how they're going to attack their prey. They sit and they wait, and you know, they can plan that, but they can't plan. They don't, most animals, when they look up at the sky, they go, holy crap, there are holes in the ceiling. We look up at it and we go, those are stars, millions of miles away. And we can, and, you know, we can think about it. We know what a star is. We can contemplate it. It's your forebrain that lets that happen. All these other parts, they're just basic animal parts. Whether you're an insect all the way up until you're a, a primate. So the diencephalon, we're going to talk about. Diencephalon, right next to you, might want to write the word thalamus in quotes. Because every part of the diencephalon has the word thalamus in it. There's actually one missing here. You have the hypothalamus, the thalamus, and anybody know the third one? The epithalamus. The epithalamus only has one significant figure, and it's called the pineal gland that makes melatonin that helps you sleep. And we'll talk about that when we get to it. The cerebrum has an area called the basal nuclei, which is the base of the cerebrum, the big lump above your head, or up here. Right down in the center, you have all this gray matter called the, the basal nuclei. And then out on the surface, you have this area that's white. Well, it's gray matter. It goes gray, then white, and then gray matter again. And the cerebral cortex is this real thin layer of gray matter that helps you process information, complex information. So the cerebral cortex is really only a few millimeters thick. It's not very thick at all. But it does all of your consciousness. Not like the Jiminy Cricket consciousness. I mean, your, your awareness of your world your ability to interact on a conscious, like intentional level with your world. So when you look at different parts again, brainstem here, cerebellum back here. As you go up in here, you've got actually basal nuclei down here at the core. Here's your diencephalon, hypothalamus, thalamus, and the epithalamus that covers over the top with the pineal gland at the back. If you took a slice up here, that gray matter on the surface is the cortex. Cortex is Latin for, anybody know what it's Latin for? Bark. Why would it be Latin for bark? Why would they call the outer surface of your brain that's all shriveled and wrinkled like this the cortex? Because it looks like the bark of a tree. Yeah. Even when you talk about the kidney, the outer surface of the kidney is called the cortex. It's the outer layer. Right? So the brain stem continues to the spinal cord. It's actually the transition between the brain and the spinal cord. You have to know these three parts. You've got the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. I just heard some Waterboy fans out there. So it controls life-sustaining processes like breathing, digestion. Life-sustaining is the key. That's your most primitive area. That's your gut behavior. Okay. Oldest part of the brain. I think I already mentioned that, actually. Um, does it talk about all three of the parts in your nose right here? Brain. I want to say that there's another part that says you do a omegata. Oh, yep, there is another part we're we'll talking about. So right now, the only thing I want you to write down, when you look at the midbrain, I want you to write eye and ear reflexes, or you can write sight and sound reflexes. <clears throat> so if you remember in anatomy, I don't know how in-depth your anatomy class went, but in the midbrain, there are little, four little bumps on there. They're called the inferior and superior colliculi. 
When you hear something like that, what do you do? Man, I'm going to break this one of these times. I better be careful. You instinctively, no matter what you're doing, you look to that direction, right? The sound comes in, goes right to the midbrain, comes back, and makes you orient your eyes to wherever that sound's at. What happens if you see a bright flash in the corner? You look. If it's the sun, it doesn't matter. You know, if somebody opens a, a window shade and it's the direct side of the sun, you go, and then you turn away. Your instinct is to look in that direction. Wherever you see some extreme change in vision, you direct yourself to that way. That's because of that midbrain. The reason I'm pointing this out is that your eyes, your pupils, the reflexes, when you see something visually, that vision comes in, it directs your vision that way, but it also adjusts the pupils. When you look towards that light, what happens to your pupils? They constrict, right? If somebody has damage to the brain stem and you shine a light in their eye and you get nothing, guess what you know is damaged? What part of the brain stem is damaged? The midbrain. You know the pathway going to the midbrain is damaged. The next area is the pons. And the most important things about the pons you want to write down is pons is the bridge between the cerebellum, the cerebrum, and the spinal cord. Pons literally means bridge in Latin. It's a transition point. It's the connecting point between these three areas. The next thing you want to have written down for the pons, fine-tuning breathing. That's the place, and we won't actually talk about that in detail until we get to the respiratory system. But if that part's damaged, what are you going to notice about their breathing? When you're sitting here, you have good control of your pons. You can plan. You can anticipate your breath. You don't even have to think about your breath. You're breathing nice and gently in and out this nice, comfortable breathing rate. If your pons is damaged, what do you notice about their breathing? It's going to be irregular. It's going to be weird. They may be breathing heavy. <laughs> And then they may just stop breathing. And then they might start breathing heavy again. <sighs> and they might stop breathing after that. It's called Shane Stokes respirations. You can tell if they have that, guess what part of the brain stem's damaged? The pons. If you're looking at somebody that has brain damage, brain swelling up here, there's only one place the brain can swell to. Can it expand through the cranium? Nope, there's only one big hole in the cranium that your brain can squish out of. What's it called? Guess you didn't know you are going to go back to anatomy so much this semester, huh? The foramen magnum. It's the big hole at the base of the skull. If your brain starts swelling, that's the only place it gets squished to. So your brain, like toothpaste, is going to start squeezing down here. The first thing it's going to compress is your midbrain. What are you going to start losing? Sight and sound reflexes. The second thing that's going to happen is their breathing is going to change because it's smashing the pons. So they start breathing that, that respiration I told you. <laughs> They, they do that pattern. You know they have brain swelling. Guess what? If they start breathing like this, guess what the doctor's going to do? They get the saw out and they cut a hole in the top of their brain. Why? Not the top of the brain, the top of the skull, I should be specific. So that the brain can actually start squishing upwards and take that pressure off. Because if you smash the next area, the medulla oblongata, if that gets smashed, guess what happens to you? You die. Right? Very straightforward. And this is so important. The medulla oblongata controls all of the basic life functions. Your heart rate. Can your heart beat without your medulla oblongata? No. Yes. But the medulla oblongata affects how fast it beats. Your medulla oblongata controls the fact that you can breathe. Does it control your fine tuning of breathing? No, it just controls the fact that you can breathe. If you took a nail gun straight to medulla oblongata, but your pons was fine, you stop breathing instantly. Poof, you're done. You'll never forget that example now. <laughs> it controls vomiting, sneezing, gagging, coughing. I don't remember the other dwarfs, but it seems like they're named after all the dwarfs, right? Sneezy, coffee, happy, I don't know. Doc, maybe not. Maybe not all of them. But all the basic life functions, Do you, is sneezing important for you? Yes, it's trying to clear up things from your nasal passage. Is coughing important? Yes. yes, if you have blockage in your airway that could kill you, you've got to get it out. These are basic life functions. If you lose the medulla oblongata, you're dead. If that is the only part of the body that dies, your whole body is going to die. It's super important. Life-sustaining processes, primarily the medulla oblongata. <clears throat> Next is the cerebellum. Cerebellum, balance, and coordination are the keys. 
it doesn't always control the initial movement, but it helps you fine tune that movement. So your ability to walk across the room is actually coming from up here at the top of your brain. But your ability to walk coordinated without falling over or staggering, that is controlled by the cerebellum. So skilled voluntary movements. Riding a bicycle, where to actually put your pedals and how to keep balance so you don't fall sideways. Cerebellum's incredible. Cerebellum actually has as many neurons in it as the whole upper part of the brain. It's just that they're so tightly packed in that little area they call the arbor vitae, the tree of life. And they're so tightly coordinated. If you're a gymnast, this area is even more tightly packed with branches than the average person is just used to walking, sitting, and <coughs> riding a bicycle. They did tests on rats where they took rats in three situations. They took rats and they made them gymnastic rats. They put toys in where they could walk across ropes in their cage. They could walk in their little treadmill. They could do all these fun things. They had lots of toys to play with. And they took another group of rats that had no toys, but they could stare and watch the ones that had the toys, which seems like torture. And they took another group of rats all the way on the opposite side of the room, so they all they could do is see the wall. They had no toys. They had nothing. They just lived in this little box. And when, they, when these rats were time to put them down, they took their cerebellums. The gymnastic rats, their cerebellum was so tightly packed, they found more neural connections in the cerebellum than either of the other two rats. The ones that could do nothing had really loose connections. I mean, they had really underdeveloped cerebellums. But what was interesting is the group in between that could see the gymnastic rats, they had more tightly packed than the ones that had nothing, but not as tightly packed as the others. What could you take from that experiment? The ones that actually do the activity got the best coordination. The ones that just got to watch it still learn from watching. So can you learn from watching things happen? When you learn to ride a bike, did your parents just put you on it and push you? Usually they take you around other kids that are riding it or they'll ride around you or whatever and you've seen or observed them and then they help you through it. You don't always have to actually do the thing for the first time to learn it. You can watch them do it. So a lot of the things that you learn, like even in lab, you'll see um, not necessarily this lab, but in labs, period, you'll see dissected first or done first, and then you repeat the, the procedure because you get a chance to learn a little bit. And that's cerebellum. Okay, and the diencephalon. Diencephalon, what's the key word here? Hypothalamus, thalamus, epithalamus, it's the thalamus, right. Hypothalamus right next to it now, and we're going to talk about this in better detail later again, but write four Fs. Every time I think of the hypothalamus, what got me through was I remembered it, it revolved around four Fs. Freezing. Helped me regulate my body temperature. Whether it was too hot or too cold, it helped me regulate it. Freezing. The second one was feeding. It helped me with appetite control. It turns off your appetite. When you're hungry, it turns it on. When you're craving things like water, it turns it on. Your thirst. It's the hypothalamus. Anything that revolves around feeding. When you go to the refrigerator and you stand here open your, and you open the door and you don't really feel like you want to eat anything, but you eat anything anyway, guess what your hypothalamus was actually telling you? It wasn't saying go eat. It was telling you go get something because I'm thirsty. So you eat a sandwich or whatever. You're like, ah, oh, what the hell, I'm making eat a sandwich. You get done. Do you feel any better? No, because you didn't do what? You didn't drink. So you go back to the fridge and grab another snack and another snack and another snack. If you're trying to lose weight, one of the first things they tell you is when you go to the refrigerator, do what instead? Grab a glass of water, drink it down, and wait a few minutes. And if you're feeling better and you lose that craving, then it was thirst, not hunger, that was driving you there. So you've got freezing, feeding. The next one is fighting. It controls your basic aggression. It controls your basic um, like fight or flight instincts. <laughs> so it actually controls part of the endocrine system, like epinephrine. So freezing, feeding, fighting. And the last one is sex. <laughs> <laughs> That's the fourth F. <laughs> fornicating. I don't know what you were thinking of. But fornicating. It drives your sex instincts and also your sexual reproduction ability. It drives the ability to make testosterone in men. It drives the ability to make estrogen in women. Those two chemicals are made in the gonads, but you know what? If your hypothalamus weren't turned on, you wouldn't make those. The hypothalamus tells the gonads to make these things. It turns up your sex instinct and it turns up your ability to make sex hormones. So, fornicating. <clears throat> what other F word? <laughs> Fun? Right. And then thalamus, 
right next to this somewhere, I want you to put, oh, there it is, traffic controller. That's a good word, good term. All of your sensory signals go to the thalamus, and then it's a traffic controller. It redirects the signals. When you see with vision, that pathway goes up to the thalamus, and the thalamus says, what do you really need? Because when you're taking in vision, you're taking in millions of megapixels worth of information every second. All that information is worthless, except for just what's important right in, in the middle of your view. So it cleans it up and says, you don't need any of that. Let's just focus on this. And it sends that information back to the occipital lobe to interpret your vision. The thalamus sorts it. When you hear noises, how many people are good at tuning out noises? Like if, you, if you're working in a place and they're working in construction outside and you hear the jackhammer, after like a day or two of being around it, you start working and then you forget the jackhammer's there usually, if it's mild in the background. Your thalamus takes that information and says, you don't need to hear the jackhammer, it weeds it out. So it weeds the information, it's a traffic controller. Taste, touch, sound, smell, all those go up into the thalamus and it weeds out and only picks out the important things for you. Oh, epithalamus, I forgot that one, let's go back. Epithalamus. That has the pineal gland, and that's a major controller of sleep. It's not the only controller of sleep in the body, but it's a major controller because it has that chemical called melatonin in it. <clears throat> Those are the diencephalon. Right? And then the cerebrum is the very top part of your brain. So above the diencephalon, we've talked about the brainstem, the cerebellum. Here's the diencephalon. All this up here is the cerebrum. Whether it's the cortex, or it's the, the white matter underneath the cortex, or it's the basal ganglia, which is the gray matter under the, the white matter. All this big lump. If you ever watch, uh, what's that movie with Gina Davis and Tom Hanks and Madonna, where they were softball players. League of Their Own. I love his description of the, the brain. It's the lump, three feet above your ass. But, right, he says, hey, ump, use your brain. You know that lump, three feet above your ass. Love that line. Anyway, the cerebrum up there is not the same as the cerebellum. When we refer to cerebral, we're talking about the cerebrum. When we're talking about cerebellar, we're talking about cerebellum. Don't get those words confused. So you have the cortex. Actually, I just listed these. The cortex, the white matter, and then the nuclei that are down in the center of it. And we're going to talk about those in better detail. Now let's talk about the brain sides. You've got the left and the right hemisphere, which that means half sphere, right? Right hemisphere, the other half is the left hemisphere. But you have this major connector that's white matter that goes between them. It's called the corpus callosum. And the corpus callosum, it's this gigantic connecting body, corpus callosum. What's cool about this is it lets the left half of your brain talk to the right half and vice versa. When we start talking a little bit more about the left and right sides, the left hemisphere is more of your analytical side. It's for logic. It's for reasoning. It's for math skills. When you speak, it's because of the left side of your brain. I always think of the left side of the brain as the geeky accountant type of person. What side of the body does the left side control? The right side. Most of your analytic skills when you have to write down things, like you have to write math skills, you have to write language, it's the right hand for most of us, right? It's the left side of the brain that's controlling that. The right side of the brain controls the left body. It's more creative. It's artistic. It's more emotional. It understands arrangement of things like maps. What do we usually associate with people who are more creative? What handed or does it seem like a lot of them are? Left handed. They're good at accessing the right side of their brain. If you look at all the great artists from history, those people are, are total right brainers because they can draw a picture and it has dimension to it. They make really good spatial arrangements. Their, their creations weren't stick figures. They actually had dimension to all their drawings. They're very right brain. The right brain people are usually the more artistic types out there, the more emotional types. No? And when you think about it, too, a lot of those creative people, they struggle with emotional disorders. Schizophrenia, depression, bipolar, a lot of those. Right. So back to the corpus callosum, it allows your emotional side and your logical side to connect. What's really interesting is that when people get seizures, what they find is there's usually some location, they call it an epileptic foci, a location in your brain that starts the seizure. Well, when people get really bad seizures, that seizure starts here, but it spreads across this hemisphere and then to the other, and it shuts down everything. It just makes them shut everything down. So you've heard of those tonic-clonic seizures where people will drop on the ground, and they seize, and then they stop their brain function. The brain actually goes black for a short time, and then it has to reset. Well, some people can have hundreds of seizures a day, and what they found is with these people, 
back in the 50s and 60s, they would open up their brain and start cutting things out. One of the things they cut was they cut right down the middle. They went, well, let's divide their brain. They cut the corpus callosum. An interesting thing happened. They'd still get some seizures, but they were never as bad as the original. Um, what would happen is they'd isolate the seizure to one side. So they may actually have um, what they call an absent seizure, where they just kind of space out a little bit because it was just one part of the brain that was, was seizing or shutting off, I should say. Another interesting fun fact that they found is that these people became split-brained, which means that their right brain and their left brain became independent. So the right side of the brain would actually control the left side of the body without control of the left brain. And the left brain was the same way. There's an episode of House about this too, but this is based on a real story. So there was an accountant that he had this. He had hundreds of seizures a day. And they, they did this procedure on him when he you know, recovered. When he was getting ready to go back to work, he would start buttoning his shirt up with his right hand, but his left hand would go along underneath and unbutton the shirt at the same time. So he'd button with this one and unbutton with this one. His right hand was controlled by what side of his brain? The logical side said, yay for accounting, I love this stuff, I'm such a geek, right? So it would button up the shirt all excited about going to work. But the right brain's going, accounting sucks. Let's stay home and draw colory pictures, let's be artistic and creative, let's play with some Play-Doh. And so it would unbutton the shirt and say, let's go to the back of the pajamas and have fun. So what the doctor said, well, it looks like you need to shove your left hand in the back of your pants while you're getting ready for work in the morning. So it's kind of funny how that works, but there was, like I said, an episode of House where this guy was like throwing stuff at people with his, his left hand because he was pissed off at them. And they called that the deaf mute side because does it have language? Nope, language is over here. This side doesn't have language skills. It has emotional skills, but not language. So it can feel anger, it can feel love, it can feel all these different things. So that's kind of an interesting thing. When you cut the brain in half, your brain develops so that you have ability on both sides. But when you split it in half, you have two independent brains. As kids, you get this thing called deja vu that's supposed to go away in your early teens. Because deja vu, they believe, is that these two sides of the brain haven't learned to connect. So one side will experience this thing, you experience it in real life, and it goes, oh, that's what it is. And the signal's delayed just enough, and when it gets to the other side, they go, hey, I feel like this has happened already. And you get that deja vu feeling. And it's supposed to go away, like I said, in your teens, and if you're still feeling deja vu, you may have a brain disorder. Just saying. <laughs> Okay, so I think I covered that one. So the cerebrum, here are the major categories you need to get familiar with. You've got the cerebral hemispheres, where I talked just briefly about the left and the right. You've got the corpus callosum, which does what for you? Connects the two sides. What's it made out of, gray or white matter? It's white. This big connection is white matter. Right now, you may as well write this down, gray matter. Remember, this is a big wad of neurons, but they're well-organized neurons. The gray matter is always where you find cell bodies, dendrites, and synapses. The gray matter is full of cell bodies, which have that dark nucleus, which is part of the reason it's gray. It has the synapse is full of neurotransmitters. And it has the dendrites that are covered with receptors, which are made out of proteins. All those things stain dark. They look dark to the naked eye, too, because they're full of dark proteins. So up here along the edge of the brain, the cortex, lots and lots of cell bodies. It's where they're talking to each other. Down here, this is actually more of a gray than a tan, but lots of cell bodies again. This white matter, you write under here, is the axon. It's actually the myelin sheath you're seeing. There's so much myelin sheath in white matter, it looks white. Do you know what myelin sheath's made out of? Fat. It's made out of lipids. When I was a kid, my mom, I'm from, I'm from Hillbilly, Illinois. My mom, everything she cooked, it didn't matter what it was, it had a scoop of Crisco grease in it. So when I was a kid, I remember putting my finger in that grease because I thought it looked kind of cool and I wanted to feel like it, how it felt, and my finger just sunk in it. I'll never forget that feeling, right? What color is Crisco? It's that whitish, gray, nasty color, right? And then when I first started doing spinal cord operations and I looked at the first spinal cords I got to work at and I touched it, guess what it felt like? Crisco, guess what it looked like? Crisco, guess what it is? Not Crisco, but it's fat. It's fat. It's the same stuff. So when you see white matter, you're just looking at that myelin sheath that's just a bunch of lipidy, textury stuff. It's whatever the majority of, of the, the matter is that you're seeing. The majority of white is fat. The majority of gray is proteins. So anywhere you see gray matter, even in the spinal cord, it's exactly the same. When you look at the spinal cord and the gray matter in the spinal cord, what's it made out of? 
Cell bodies, synapses, dendrites, the connections. When you look at the white matter, what's it full of? Axons, myelin sheath, that send the signal to other parts of the spinal cord. So this part of the brain may send a signal through here, down its axon, down to the nuclei. This part of the nuclei may send a signal down into the brainstem. Brainstem goes to the spinal cord. The pathways, and then the basal nuclei, again, it's gray matter, and it's at the core. Not the cortex, it's the core of the brain, the cerebrum. So again, you can see it here. <coughs> okay, parts of the brain you need to know. You should already know these names because they're, they're named after what that sits on top of them. The frontal lobe sits just underneath the frontal bone. Parietal lobe sits under the parietal lobe, or burnt bone, right. So they're coordinated by the bone. Right. What you need to know about each of them, first thing you need to know about these, nothing's absolute. When you talk about the brain, nothing is absolute. Even when we do brain surgery, as soon as you take the, the top off somebody's skull, the first thing they do is they test the parts of the brain to, to make a map of that person's brain because your brain is not exactly like the person next to you. Nothing's absolute. Um, I just watched a story. I watched it when I was undergrad, and I just watched a news story about it a few weeks ago. But there was this girl that when she was born, she kept having really bad seizures. And, and one side of her hemisphere, one of her hemispheres was actually so extremely damaged that she was going to die. So they said, the only way that your daughter's going to live is if we take the left hemisphere out. And so they're like, well, you know, if it's going to keep her alive, then that's fine. And they did. They took the whole left hemisphere out of her brain. And they put a, a pad filler in there to help support the right hemisphere and hold it in place. And they said, well, of course, now your daughter's never going to be able to move the right side of her body. She's never going to be able to walk like another kid. She's never going to be able to talk like another kid. She lost the left hemisphere, but you'll have your daughter. She'll still have emotional connections. She'll still, you know, she'll still show, show you love. She'll have all these emotions, but she just won't have the normal functions of a normal kid. And then this was, this happened like in the, in the 1980s. And when I was an undergrad, I saw a video, and they showed a video of this girl, and they started off by showing the soccer field and all these kids running around. And they told you the name of the girl, and they said she is one of those kids. She was running, she was playing. You would never know it was one of those kids because her brain, one side developed so that it worked as if both, if both sides of the brain were okay. She was in college at that time, writing, speaking, doing college level skills, the things the doctor said she'd never be able to do. And then I watched another one about a, a little girl, it was like a year ago. I watched it just a few weeks ago, but um, she had part of her brain removed a year ago and they said the same thing. She's never gonna be able to do this, that, and the other thing. And in my mind, I'm thinking what? Bullshit, right? Because obviously that doctor didn't do enough of his research um, for whatever reason. And he was probably just playing it safe and saying she's not going to do this because then when she does do it, they're like, it's a miracle. Right? <laughs> Doctors are like that. They always like to undershoot and say, oh, it's never going to happen. Because then if it doesn't happen, they're like, I was right. But if it does happen, they're like, look how good I am. <laughs> so when you look at these different areas, I'm going to tell you the main functions. But keep in mind, other parts of the brain can do this too. Like the occipital lobe, visual input. You see here, it goes to the thalamus, it goes back to the occipital lobe, where you interpret that vision. What about blind people? Do they not have an occipital lobe? They do. What's kind of cool is if you put them in an MRI, if they're an older blind person that can read Braille, you put them in an MRI and you have them read the Braille, guess what happens? The occipital lobe lights up as if they were seeing the letters. So the brain reorganizes itself to be the most efficient. You know, um, What's that? You only use 10% of your brain? That is also crap. You use 100% of your brain. If you don't use a part of your brain, it will reorganize itself to be useful. You know how they say you only use 10% of your brain? I think we only use 10% of our heart. <laughs> Who knows that movie? Wedding Crashers. It's hilarious. Okay, so occipital lobe, you've got vision with the temporal lobe. You've got, it's right here. Guess what sensation has the fastest route to it? Hearing. So temporal lobe, you're going to have auditory sensation. The auditory center, the primary auditory cortex is what we call it. We'll talk about it next week. But it's right there in the temporal lobe. Occipital lobe's primary cortex is back, or sorry, vision cortex is back in the occipital lobe. So temporal lobe, you want to think of sensory input. When you touch something, when you feel something, it's going to go to the parietal lobe. But when you start interpreting it, what it is, that signal actually goes to the temporal lobe. And this is kind of cool. Face recognition is actually at the border of the parietal and temporal lobe. If you have a stroke in this area, you don't recognize human faces anymore. 
You could see people and recognize they're human, but if they were a family member, you have no idea who they are. Not a stinking clue. All right, looks like that's about all the time we have, and I'm going to give you extra credit if you want it. So, <coughs> we have one minute for me to show you this. There's so much about the brain I wish I could talk about, but we don't have time to. Uh, how do I get into Internet Explorer? Here you go. And I'll move it over to your folder. Right now it's in last semester. I didn't think I was going to do it, but I love the brain so much I'm going to do it again. There are four videos. You can watch any one you want. I don't care which one. They're all really good videos. You can watch them all, but I can, I'm only giving you extra credit for one of them. I can barely see on this computer. Uh, ooh, summer. There we go. Okay, so I'm just going to transfer it to yours. It'll look exactly like that. It says extra credit videos. You're going to go into it and it tells you what to do. It says you can watch one, just one. You can watch all of them, but if you want the extra credit, just watch one of these. So click on any of these links and watch the video. Um, here's one that's about understanding perception. This is a really cool discovery video that I, I liked when I was an undergrad, but it helps you understand what happens when you damage certain parts of the brain. Uh, here's another one, Nova, how the brain works. This is actually the newest one. And his name's Tyson something or other. Maybe his last name's Tyson, but he's a neurologist. And he's studying the brain, and he talks about some of the cool functions. In fact, I'll talk about some of them in class next week. Uh, there's one called Secrets of the Mind, which is down here. And Secrets of Mind has one of the most famous neuroscientists. His name is Ramachandran. And he will walk you through some, I think it's like five major disorders that are really unique, like phantom limb syndrome, um, something called the cop syndrome where you look at your family and they're aliens to you you don't believe they're actually who they are so these really interesting disorders and he'll talk about how they happen so just watch that and then follow the procedure it just says write one page so one page is like what two paragraphs on what you learn from it so take each of the major disorders that they talk about or major functions they talk about write what you thought was cool about it and then submit it um i think i made it worth i don't remember it was five or ten but whatever is written in here, I don't want to say one thing that actually happens to be the other one. All right, so it's 2.32. Thanks for the extra two minutes, and I'll see you next week.